Okay, um, so uh, welcome everybody to uh, the Distinguished Lecture Series talk today. I'm very happy to introduce Margot Seltzer. Um, so Margot, just to give you a little bit of background, she, she uh, started her academic career um, at Harvard for her undergrad. She went on to Berkeley to do her PhD and then um, went back to join the faculty at Harvard. Um, and was at Harvard for um, more than 25 years mm -hmm. before recently moving uh, to the University of British Columbia as uh, Canada 150 uh, Research Chair in Systems, which is great, and also Cheriton Family Chair at UBC. So I think this might be, is Jimmy here? Where did Jimmy go? So this might be the first time we actually have two Cheriton chairs in the same room, so <laughs> this is great. Um, so Margot has had a, a long and very illustrious research career. Um, she uh, has worked in, she has very broad interests in systems, in operating systems, file and storage systems, data provenance, some uh, AI related stuff I've seen recently. Um, she is uh, an AI fellow, so has had a very um, distinguished career. And uh, another thing that I'll mention about Margot that's great is that uh, she has uh, given a lot of her time back to the research community over the years, uh, especially through USENIX Association, um, where she was a director for a long time and is a past president of the uh, USENIX Association as well. So I'm glad that we finally have you here after oh, 25 okay. years or <laughs> whatever it's been, but welcome to Waterloo. Thank you. So as Ken said, my research interests are fairly broad, thus the title of the talk, Systems Research Construed Broadly. You can, there's a fine line between broad research interests and short attention span, <laughs> but I'd claim they're both okay. So this talk is a little bit different. I'm going to start with a little bit of soapboxing about how I view computer systems and what I really mean by systems construed broadly. And then I'll do a series of some number of research vignettes. And the reason I'm going to say some number is that I have prepared three. I have found that the first one often engages a lot of interaction with the audience, which I completely welcome. So if you want to interrupt and ask questions, that's A-OK. -okay. But here's the catch. When we finish the first part, if we've had a lot of questions, then we may end up doing a vote to decide which of the other two vignettes we talk about. So we'll see how it goes. It'll be a little dynamic. We'll have a good time. And ideally, some of you will at least be outraged by something I say. So on that note, I want to ask, like, where did computer systems come from? And I would claim that it came from asking a very fundamental question, which is, how do you build a mechanical computing device? And so when that was the question, computer systems was one big area that comprised hardware and software and programming languages and pretty much everything you can imagine that wasn't pure mathy. And fairly soon after we started building devices, we split and said, well, actually, hardware and software are different areas. And then, well, you know, the database folks and the programming languages folks decided that their concerns were different from those of the operating systems folks. And then even on the architecture side, we saw a class emerge and start to think about high-performance computing as different from conventional hardware. And then we saw operating, start, operating systems start to splinter into things like distributed computing and networking, which oddly enough grew into different communities. Have you ever wondered about that? But anyway, you know, then we saw like, oh my god, security, like that's a problem. And that grew into its own community. Now, as someone who spent most of my career in the uneasy middle ground between databases and operating system, or databases and file systems, it was you know, such a relief that the storage community emerged as its own community. Um, and then we saw some more splintering. So we saw scientific computing emerge as an area. And then this one really puzzled me. We had networking and we had distributed systems, but then we needed something new called networked systems, and that spawned its own community. 
Meanwhile, in architecture, mobility suddenly introduced a bunch of problems that also impacted software. Then we had things like the Internet of Things, because that's somehow different from other forms of networking. We had embedded systems, and of course, VLSI was also a thing. So this wonderful world that started as one big happy family has really splintered into a gazillion different communities, and maybe I've even missed your favorite community. And I'm going to claim that this is actually a problem. So I understand how we got here. But at the same time, some of the most interesting research happens at the boundaries of these boxes. So if you want to leave now, if you want to take nothing else away from the talk, I just want to make a plea to think about the lines more than the boxes and think about the intersections and overlaps of these areas because I would claim that that's where some of the more interesting problems emerge. And I'm going to try to give you some examples of that. So as I look at what we're doing at UBC, we cover sort of many of these areas. If you look at just what I plan on doing or have been doing or am doing, and then when you add Ivan in, we cover some more areas. And we're hiring people, and I'm very excited that I'm pretty soon going to be able to cover some more of those areas. And because this is 2019, you can take any of these areas, and you can sprinkle machine learning pixie dust on them, and you get a whole new area called systems plus ML, or sysML, or whatever you want to call it. So here is our research landscape. And I would just encourage everyone to become a systems person, because as you can see, there's so much to choose from. But also that if you are a systems person, that you think about systems broadly, and think about the ways that these areas intersect and overlap, and how we can take techniques from one area and move them to another. So on that note, let us talk about some research vignettes. Ideally, we will tell three stories, again, depending on how much I offend you in the first one. The first one is something called automatically scalable computation, which is what happens when a really bold student comes to graduate school. The second one is a discussion about runtime provenance applications. And then the third one, you might wonder what on earth it has to do with systems, because it's um, certifiably optimal rule lists, which is often thought of as machine learning or optimization. But I'm going to tell you it's systems. So on that note, let's talk about automatically scalable computation. This is a joint project with colleagues at Boston University. But it's really the brainchild of Amos Waterland, who's in bold there. So Amos came to me as a first year graduate student and told me his grand research vision, which is a research vision we've had for years, which is that he wanted to take a sequential program, wave a magic wand, and have it automatically scale to whatever resources were available, whether it be millions of cores, lots of memory, whatever. And I thought, how cute. Um, <laughs> So he has a lifetime research agenda, which is a great thing for a graduate student to have. And if he wants to work on it, you know, he'll work on it for this year. And at the end of the year, he'll realize that this is really not a good project for a PhD. And then he'll go do real research. Well, the beauty of being a professor is that sometimes your students prove you wrong. So Amos proved me wrong. We spun up a big project. This is an NSF grant that we've gotten with the folks at BU. And one of the other things that's cool is that not only do we have graduate students, faculty, undergraduates, we have high school students who worked on this project, too. So OK. If I have to place this project in the spectrum of systems, it has elements of high performance computing, which I didn't highlight. But it also has elements of scientific computing, operating systems, architecture, maybe some distributed computing in there, too. Turns out there's also some interesting storage problems. So I highlighted three areas, but it spans a good chunk of this map. So let's start with the first question. If you were to take up running, the first day out, you might not run very far or very fast. But if you kept going day after day, you would expect to get faster over time. So why don't our computer programs do that? Right? So here's a very simple program that is going to iterate from 1 to 10. And it's going to call this factor program. And what the factor program is going to do is something like what's shown on the right, which is it's going to take a big semi-prime and try to find its prime factors in a really stupid fashion, admittedly. And we're going to run this 10 times, but on different values of the big semi-prime. So if you were to measure how long it takes, you would get performance that looks sort of like this. Right? Every time you run it, it takes about the same amount of time. 
So why doesn't it get any faster? Well, it doesn't get any faster because we run the same program. But let me show you what happens if instead of just running this program, we run it under control of our ASK monitor, which stands for Automatically Scalable Computation. Now what you get is behavior that looks something like that. And it turns out that because of the particular way this prototype is built, the best you can do with two cores is get a one-third speed up. So we're getting about the best we could do. And so the rest of this talk, is all, or the rest of this vignette, is like, how the heck do we do that? How do we make a program run faster each time we run it? So to explain that, I want you to join me in a thought experiment. Imagine that we take the memory and the registers of a regular single core processor, and we consider them as comprising a really large state space. Right? So if this is memory and registers, that's a really large state space. If we think about this as a state space, and I pose the question, what does execution look like? You might say something like, well, first you have to initialize this big state space. So that's loading of a program. And then when you want to execute an instruction, for example, the load zero, what you're doing is you're moving from one point in the state space to another point in the state space. And when you execute another instruction, you move to yet another point. So in a model like this, what does a program execution look like? It looks like a path through this very large state space. I show a state space in two dimensions, but it's really a path in a very, very high dimensional space. So if you take this model of computation and I say, how would you parallelize it? You would say, well, that's really easy. I would divide the path up into equal sized chunks. I would put each of those chunks on its own processor, and then I would just execute all those pieces in parallel. And I would therefore achieve linear speed up and run in one over n of the time. Great, solved, done, do I get to leave? No. What's the problem here? Uh, something over there depends on... Absolutely. So something over here depends on something over there. If I knew how to cut this trajectory, well then why would I bother running anything? I would just predict that I end up there and I would get infinite speed up and wouldn't that be grand? So we need to try something smarter than that. That isn't quite going to work. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to start executing. And as we execute, we're going to start to build a model of what we think the program's going to do. And then we're going to make predictions about future states that our program might be in sometime in the future. So each of these blobs is supposed to represent a probability distribution of what our model thinks is a future state. So I make a bunch of those predictions. Now, once I have all those predictions, I can do exactly what I proposed. I can assign each of those predictions to a core, and then I can start to execute. So my main program is going to continue running, and each of these other cores is going to execute from one of these predicted spots. And now, periodically, the main core will stop and say, hey, have any of you guys seen this state? And in this case, they all say, nah. So we keep running. And then the main core says, how about here? Say, nah, keep running. But this time, when we say, has anybody been here? One of the cores says, why, yes, in fact, I did. And so we say, great, where did you end up? He says, I ended up there. And at that moment, you fast forward to the end of that speculative execution. So when your predictions are correct is when you get speed up. If you were perfectly able to predict your states, you get perfect speed up. Anything less than perfect predictions, and you get less than perfect speed up. And so once again, we find a trajectory, and we get speed up. So before I go into more details to convince you that I'm not kidding, this is a real live implementation of this approach. The black line shows ideal scaling. If I got perfect linear scaling, what would I get? We don't get that. The red line says, if I were to make perfect predictions, given the overheads of this implementation, what kind of scaling is possible? 
and the blue line is what we actually get. So on 44 cores, we essentially get a speed up of over 25 with zero programmer effort, which is pretty darn cool. So let's figure out how we're gonna make that work. Let's start with some intuition. If I showed you this trajectory and asked if you thought you could build a predictor for it, how many people would say yes? Everyone? Good. Good. If I showed you this program and said, how many could make a prediction, how many of you would say yes? Let us hope that things like RSA encryption produce trajectories that look like that. Just saying. In reality, many programs look kind of like this, right? And you can squint at that and say, you know, I could imagine maybe building a predictor for certain points in that trajectory. So for programs that have trajectories with this flavor, maybe we can actually build some models. So allow me to present our solution first in the form of an abstract architecture. Because the beauty of the way we've designed this is that if there's any particular element that looks like fun, you can play. You can just plug in an element to solve one piece of the problem and then you put it all together and you get the whole system. So we begin with some trajectory-based execution engine, right? Some way to realize this model of computation. Our first task is to collect state vectors from some points in the program. And the question is, what points in the program? So our first task is what we call recognition, which is finding points in the program where we want to make predictions. Once we've found some points that we think are good for predictions, we want to feed those instruction pointers back to the trajectory engine and say, here are the places that we want you to A, build the model, B, make predictions, and there's a C in there that I've just forgotten. Um, okay, so, oh, and then ask if there are predictions, right? So you make predictions and you say, by the way, has anyone been here? Because those are the points we're all fast forward. Once you do that, then we take all the states that we set in and we feed those to a model builder, our predictors. Given the predictors, we allocate those to different cores so that they can execute those speculatively. So that's our speculator. And then after we execute one of those chunks speculatively, we enter it into a cache. And the way we use the cache is that the trajectory-based engine is going to periodically query the cache and say, have you been here? And if the cache sees it, says, yes, I have, and that's when we get speed up. Okay, general architecture. Questions so far? Yes? Is it just a generalization of your branch taken, branch not taken kind of predictor? So is it a generalization of a branch taken, branch not taken predictor? Sort of. The, the real difference here is that we are making predictions for hundreds of thousands of instructions as opposed to the tens or twenties that you find in a branch slot. Okay? Yeah, Ken. A state vector is essentially a core dump, yes. Okay, so let's look at, we have two implementations. I'm only gonna talk about one. The first one I call Scaly-ask, because what it does is it demonstrates the potential scalability. So it's a real prototype that ran real programs, but it uses a software-based virtual machine, so it's really slow. So we get good speed up relative to a slow implementation which is not as satisfying as you might want. The implementation I'll talk about today is SpeedyAsk, which runs natively on a vanilla x86. So here are the pieces. Core technology we're going to use is the PIN dynamic instrumentation tool, and we'll use that in a couple of different ways. So first, we're going to use that to build our recognizer. Now I told this story as if everything happens online, and in fact, when we built the scalable implementation, it did happen online. In this implementation, we cheat a little bit. We run the program twice to, do, to figure out where we want to make predictions. And this is really just an artifact of how we're making the predictions in a moment. We have techniques for doing them online, but right now they're slow. So what we do is we instrument all the backward branches so all the potential loop positions in the code. And then we run the program once and just count how many times those get executed. Then what we do 
is we want to find which of those jumps is executed more than, like, let's see, that such that the loop interval is big enough that we have a big enough chunk to speculate and still win on. So, you know, it's more than 100,000 instructions. And of the jumps that satisfy that, which one do you hit most frequently? Because that will give us the greatest number of opportunities to build the model and make predictions. So that's how we pick the point or points where we're going to try to build models. Does that make sense? Great. The other way we're going to use ask is when we try to actually run our program. So the way the monitor works is that we spawn off a user program and we put that and it's just going to run normally on the main core, almost normally. We're going to run it under ptrace because what ptrace is going to do is it's going to set breakpoints at those important instruction pointer places so that it can build its model, make predictions, et cetera. Meanwhile, we spawn off a copy of PIN, so we're going to use the inst dynamic instrumentation again. And this time, what PIN is going to do is it's going to spawn off a copy of the user program, but in this copy of the user program, we're instrumenting loads and stores. And I'm going to come back to how we use that in a moment. But the key thing is that it's identical to the user program, it's just instrumented with loads so that we can track load and store instructions. So now our main program runs and at some point it hits a breakpoint, which is this magic instruction pointer that we want to use to build models. At that point, we take a snapshot of the user program, we load it, we load that state vector into the instrumented program, and now we keep running. So we clear the breakpoint, the user program keeps running. So this is how we launch one of the speculative threads. Good, everybody with me? Yes? Great question. The question was, the question was, is making a copy of the state space expensive? And the answer is currently yes. And in fact, when I show you results at the end, for benchmarks that have really big state spaces, you'll see that overhead in a big way. And so doing a fast copy on write is like the next optimization to do. Okay, so this is the basic structure of how we're gonna run. How are we gonna build these models? So it turns out that, you know, because 2015, 2016, whatever, the grad student said, well, of course we're going to have to build a deep neural network to do this. And he did. And that actually turned out to be useful in a number of different domains. And then he actually had to take some time off. He was ill, and so I had an undergraduate come and pick up this work. He said, you know, we're just predicting bit values. Why don't we use decision trees? Okay, why don't we use decision trees? And lo and behold, if you don't do anything clever, then what you do is you build a model for each bit in the state. Okay, so we're building lots and lots and lots of models. And in theory, these models, like each bit state, could depend on every other bit in the entire state. So you would get this fully connected set of decision trees. And that would be kind of gross. But we can do better. How are we going to do better? Let's look at how the speculators are going to work. So the speculator, again, this is the predicted state that I'm going to go execute from. In this example, we're going to have a one instruction speculation. You would just repeat this whole process n times for your 100,000 instruction speculations. So while we speculate, the reason that we instrument loads and stores is that we want to keep track of which bits get read during this computation and which bits get written during the computation. So when we execute an instruction, we're going to maintain a mask that says, here are the bits that get read while this thing executes. So in this case, you get the instruction pointer, you get the constant value, and you get the memory location. And those are all places that are going to be read. Then you say, well, what were the values the very first time you read any of those bits, what were their values? And so you initialize the read set 
to contain the values in those bits. Now, if your instruction does a write, you're going to repeat that process with a write mask and the write value. So here are the bits that get updated in this instruction. The instruction pointer changes, and the memory location gets written into. And the values that are produced are the new instruction pointer and the result of adding 8 to whatever was in memory location A. You repeat this process for every instruction. And when you finish your speculation, you say this is a cache entry. Is everyone with me on the cache entries? OK. What we're doing logically is we're saying, OK, each speculation is a specific trajectory in this space, a little tiny piece of a trajectory. By keeping the read and write masks, each one of those speculations actually represents a class of sort of parallel or symmetric um, speculations. So a way to think about this is what one of my students coined speculative memoization. Okay, so let's think about what memoization is. Right, memoization says if I call a function and it's a pure function, then if I just record the values of the input parameters and what that function produced as output, and I get another call with those same input parameters, I can just automatically know what the output is. Okay, this is doing the exact same thing, but it's doing it on an enormous scale, and it's doing independent of any function calls. You could think of it as, you know, finding things that could be grouped in function calls with inputs. So what that lets us do, right, so if you're running a program and you call the square root routine, it doesn't matter where in your program you call the square root routine. If you call it, then you pass it the same parameter, you're going to get the same answer. Similarly, these speculations could then be called from different points in the state space and we could produce the correct answers. So let me show you how we do that. So let's imagine we have a cache with these two entries in it and we're in this state SN. And what we want to do is we want to say, hey, has anybody seen this state? If so, what's my end state? So we look at the first cache entry and we say, okay, in order to match this cache entry, you have to match on exactly these bits. Say, okay, here's my bits. You say, and here's the value that they have to have. And we look and we compare those values and we say, uh-uh, they don't match. All right, let's try the other cache entry. You have to match on exactly these values. Well, let's look at those. They have to match those and you say, voila, it's a hit. Okay, be careful, this is going to be the audience participation part. I have to now construct the final state that I get to from this speculation. How do we do that? Well, the first thing we do is we look at the bits that got written in the speculation and we have to copy those down. Where do the other bits come from? How do I fill in the rest of this final state? I heard somebody from SN, exactly. These are the bits that don't change because of the speculation, so I just get them from whatever state I'm looking up. And so this is how we use a single speculation to potentially be useful in multiple places. Does that make sense? So that's the magic. That's why we have to instrument the loads and stores during our speculative executions. Yes? So do the loads and stores include things like the program counter? And the answer is yes, we look at that and we might. So little side note, there's an ongoing argument between Amos and me about exactly how much we know about the processor. So for example, I think we should take advantage of the fact that like registers have sets of 64 bits. He wants to treat them all independently. I think the instruction pointer is the one piece of the architecture that we kind of view differently. So we do know that it's been read, we do know that it's been written, and I think we might not require a match on it so that we can use the speculations in other places. I assume that was where you were going with that. <laughs> yes? What if your memory is shared so your load values have changed? What if your memory is shared so your load values have changed? Um, we do not handle that case currently. So think, 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 think single-threaded execution. Yes? 
So I.O. is a great question. So one way to think of I.O. is that it's just a chunk of the memory space whose values you don't know yet. Okay, that makes your head hurt, but it kind of works in this model. The folks at BU have done some really interesting work. They can pretty much predict when IOs are going to happen. And so right now, to be fair, we're not using IO, and we're not using, we're, we're sort of cheating in how we do dynamic memory allocation, but they've really tried to extend the model to, to incorporate IO, and I wouldn't say we're 100% of the way there yet, but I think we're pretty close. Yes? Oh, what a great question. So the question is, how do you efficiently search for a matching entry? That is a fabulous question. So this is a really complicated lookup problem. You're saying, I want to match on this really big bit vector, but only some of the bits matter. So we actually spent, so our first implementation was a stupid linked list with compressed bit strings. And then I had two undergraduates, two really, really smart undergraduates, work on this as a data structure problem for a long time, and they come up with a bunch of really interesting try structures, and, and they were still really big and hard. And then another undergraduate came along, and totally without telling me anything, he said, oh, it turns out that the values of the live register set form a unique fingerprint pretty much. So the lookup turns into a hash table lookup where the hash keys are the contents of the live registers. So if you get a hit on that, then you look up the whole bit vector and make sure it matches, and it always does. But we don't assume it, we actually compare it. But um, they don't match, not for sure. That it's not a match, exactly. So if they don't match, then you know that this is not the same bit vector, exactly. So again, this is why you work with lots of smart students and get them involved in research because they come up with really clever solutions. And so that's our little hash table icon for the trajectory cache. Thank you for asking that question. Any others before I go on? Great. So now we have to figure out like how to allocate these speculative threads onto cores. And there are, there's actually a, a huge area of research to do here. And right now, we're doing something really stupid. So for the moment, let's assume that the speculators run exactly as fast as the main thread. Instead of predicting some random future state, we are always going to predict a specific future state. And so what we do is we run the main core, and then we just say, if, this is, if these are time steps, time steps, we say, the main core runs time step one, and while the main core is running one, our speculative threads will run time steps two, three, and four. If our predictions were correct, then at the next time step, the main thread will look and see that at the end of step one, step two has been done, then three, then four, and will immediately go to five. While the main thread is running five, the other threads do six, seven, and eight. So we just keep doing exactly the next step, assuming that we get perfect prediction. Now, the problem is that the speculative threads do not run as fast as the main thread. So in reality, what you get is something that looks like this, which is that the other threads take longer. So if, in fact, I just scheduled time step five here, that would be unfortunate because by the time time step one finishes, it says, has anybody been here? These haven't finished yet, and so they say no. And so one would then go on to two. And so what we do is we watch to see how long the speculators take, and then we make the, we, we have the speculators run at the right time step <coughs> to be able to leverage that. So at this time step, we would have this thread running time step three, and we wouldn't get perfect speed up. We would lose some speed up. So when I show you results, you're going to see two competing effects that take us away from perfect scalability. I'm sorry, three competing effects. So one is the accuracy of the predictions. Two is how much overhead does PIN introduce. And three is 
how big is that state space that we have to copy? And so those three parameters are going to dictate what kind of speed up we get. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of benchmarks. So this is the one I showed you before. Allow me to tell you what it is. So this is actually a kernel that we got from our colleagues in applied physics. This was a real problem they had and they wanted it sped up. What they had done is they had constructed a linked list and each of those linked list elements corresponded to an atomic configuration and they wanted to find which of these configurations had the lowest energy state. And it turns out that computing the energy state from the electron uh, atomic configuration is really expensive. And so they wanted to parallelize it. And so this is actually their code just grabbed out of the middle of their program. And so it's an icing model that each configuration is an element of a linked list. Now the reason this linked list is kind of interesting is because you know, compiler optimization is really good, but it can't deal with dynamic data structures in terms of prediction. But it turns out that memory allocators are actually pretty regular. And so because we don't have to make perfectly accurate predictions, all we have to do is guess like which addresses might be allocated, we can take advantage of the fact that there's some regularity to these allocations. So again, the black line would be perfect scalability. The red line is what we get if we made perfect predictions. And what you really see here in the blue line is the cost of the pin overhead. The actual state space is quite small in this application, and so you don't see a huge decrease due to having to copy that whole state space. In contrast, allow me to show a matrix multiply of two four gigabyte matrices. So in this case, the state space is really huge, and so our potential speed up is actually nowhere near ideal because the overhead that's introduced in the execution is so high. And then our predictions are not 100% accurate, and so we take another hit on the actual output. And so these are from the uh, PolyBench benchmark suite. So it turns out that all the benchmarks that have really big matrices look something like this, and all the benchmarks that have fairly small state spaces look like the other results. All right, any other questions before I move on to our next vignette? Yes. Um, do you remember the work done on time warp? Time warp. Do I remember time? Um, this was David Gutterson. So I'm, I'm, the name is sounding familiar, but I don't remember the work. If they were wrong, they threw them out, but when they were right, they got the speed up. So I'm wondering what the connection is between them. Could this improve time, time warp? Or could time warp improve, improve this? This is a great question. So this is a question about um, some former work called Time Warp that was doing something that sounded quite similar. And the question is whether Time Warp could make this more effective or this could make Time Warp more effective. And the answer is I don't know, but I appreciate you bringing that up. Because I, I remember the Time Warp work, but I don't remember it well enough to be able to answer that. It was 1980-something, yeah. <laughs> Okay. The last sentence. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, remind me again what our time is on the talk. Uh, Till about 4.30. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask us to do the, the either or choice, and we'll take a vote. So this will be majority rule. Um, I could try to whip through the two vignettes each in about 10 minutes, and that would be moderately satisfying, but perhaps unsatisfying on both, or I could talk about either one of them for the next 15-ish minutes. So there are three choices. One is try to cover both really quickly. The other is please talk about runtime provenance analysis, and the other is please talk about certifiably optimal rule lists, okay? So you get one vote, three choices. How many people say try to zip through both? A couple. How many people say runtime provenance? A few more. How many people say rule lists? Ooh. 
Okay, we're gonna do both. <laughs> Sorry, it, it's, there, there was no other answer. Um, and I'm happy to hang out after and answer questions or we'll, we'll make this work. So here's what provenance applications, it's a big chunk of the space. So what's the problem we're trying to solve? So data provenance is in fact a record of how data came to be in its current form. And the traditional way that we analyze it is that we build a capture system, we store the data in a database, and then we analyze it. The Reader's Digest summary of this work is that we swap this around. We capture it, we analyze it in real time, and then if you feel like it, we put it in a database. Why would you want to do that? Well, there's a couple reasons. So if we want to make our lives harder, it's because we can turn static graph analysis into a dynamic graph analysis problem, so that's great. But the key thing is that if you do the analysis after the fact, you can detect things that go wrong, but you can't prevent them. And what we really want to do is prevent them. The other advantage is that if you do static analysis in the database, your analyses are often a function of the size of the graph, whereas ours are a function of the complexity of the analysis we want to do. And so tasks that we're taking way too long to be practically useful, we do in real time and can actually intervene in the system. And then because we like to make our lives more challenging, if you're doing it after the fact, you have an immutable graph, but we actually have a mutable graph that we need to deal with. So I would claim that two of these are an advantage and two of these are a disadvantage. All right, data provenance comes from the art world. It tells us where something came from, and if you ever buy art, don't buy it unless you have the data provenance, otherwise you're getting a forgery. Similarly, how many of you actually know where data comes from when somebody gives you a data set? Yeah, it's a forgery. If you don't have the data provenance and don't know where it comes from, don't trust it. That's why everyone should care about provenance. So there is a standard for data provenance, and if you get me off of the video, I will tell you all about the standard. But for now, what we'll say is that the standard has things called agents, which are users or groups or things that are active. It has entities, so things like programs or data files, and it has activities, which are like processes running. And then between all of these objects, you have lots of different kinds of relationships. And so the model defines different kinds of relationships. And it turns out you can capture provenance in lots and lots of different places. So you, the, the, the computational provenance work really started in the database community, and then um, crazy people like us said, well, if you can capture it in a database, maybe you could capture it in an operating system and that would be even better. And we were absolutely the fringe lunatics of the provenance world, proud of that. You can also capture provenance out of programming languages. There's been a huge amount of activity getting provenance out of workflows. For the purposes of this talk, we're gonna talk about operating system provenance, which has now gotten the name whole system provenance. And the reason people like that is because it lets us do applications like intrusion detection. It's a form of monitoring. It's really a superset of a lot of the auditing functions that get built on computer systems today. So we've built an architecture called CAM Query. This is in conjunction mostly with folks at the University of Cambridge. And so how do we switch from this canonical capture, store, analyze into this inverted capture, analyze, store model. So we invoke the provenance capture system. Oh, and, and we want to do that so that we don't, so we can do prevention as well as detection. So CAMflow is our provenance capture mechanism, and it leverages two things that Linux kernels come with. One is something called Linux security modules. So Linux security modules is a standard interface that lets you implement security policies. So if you want either discretionary or mandatory access control, you can build a set of these modules and load them into the kernel. Because they're designed to implement security policies, it is a reasonable assumption, one that we are trying to formally prove, that we can capture all the important flows that happen in the kernel by intervening at exactly those interfaces. So we mostly use the Linux security modules 
and then we use the Linux net filter mechanism to connect some things together that otherwise we couldn't see. So that's how we do the implementation. And then what we do is we take the query and analysis and we drop that into the kernel as a small, as a collection of really tiny analysis functions. And I'm gonna show you what they look like. And then optionally, if you want to keep the provenance, you can still store it in a database. All right, so this is really a, a different architecture that is going to enable a lot of really interesting applications. So I said that we download code into the kernel for these applications, and you should be looking at me like I'm an idiot, because who would ever want to download code into the kernel? Um, yeah, well, some of us do. So the good news is that writing the applications is actually super, super simple. You have to write three functions and specify some metadata. So this is metadata that is, you know, who wrote it, what are you doing, et cetera. The three functions you have to write is an initialization function, which is whatever static data you want to set up. In our case, this is going to be an application that simply tracks confidential information flow through a system. So we're going to initialize it by saying, here's the label we care about. It's when something is marked confidential. So you can imagine this is a corporate data server and certain documents must not get transmitted off that server and we would like to prevent that from happening. So what we're going to do is we're gonna say, what the provenance engine is going to produce is a set of edges. And what an edge just says is, hey, this node, whatever it is, a file, an object, an inode, affects this other node. And we're gonna get a series of edges. And what the application is going to do is on every edge, it's going to call in edge and out edge, saying here is an edge and an input node, and here is an edge and an output node. And all the functions need to do is transmit information. So when we have an output edge, we have a node and an output edge, we want to transmit any labels on the node across the edge. And so that's exactly what we're doing here, is if the node has an edge, add the label to the, yeah, if the node has a label, add the label to the edge. Similarly, on the input side, that says you have an input edge going to a node, you wanna propagate whatever's on the edge to the node. So that's what we're doing there. And then we have one other thing, which is if the node that you're about to propagate to is like a network socket, you wanna say, don't do that. And so that's what that raise warning message is. It says, you're about to take that confidential label and put it on an output socket. I don't wanna let you do that. Instead of adding the label, I'm gonna raise a warning and we're gonna prevent that flow. So in under 30 lines of code, this is a full application for tracking information flow through an operating system. And you didn't have to write a whole new kernel to do it. All right, so the implementation is basically these LSM modules and net filters, and there's a bunch of stuff on the CAMflow website. But the high order bit is that basically any time that a process reads state, we create an edge, so the state now influences the process. And any time a process writes some shared state, that process influences the state and we propagate the flow there. So that's what these edge, what, that's what these routines are doing. So you might ask the question, say, well this sounds really great, but isn't this going to like just cream my system performance? And the answer turns out to be no. So if you look at just the overhead on an individual system call, it can look kind of high, but if you look at sort of the application overheads, they're actually quite low. So this is unpacking an entire kernel distribution and building an entire kernel distribution. And what we're seeing when we do the full provenance capture and detection and everything else is that our overheads in that case are really small, 5% and under. And even for Postmark, which is very metadata intensive and uses the operating system a lot, we're only seeing a 15% overhead. So this is totally plausible to do at runtime. All right, that was the fairly quick Reader's Digest version of runtime provenance capture. Take a couple questions, and I'm gonna run just a little bit over on the other one. Any questions? Great. 
So let's talk about certifiably optimal rule lists. So this is work done with an interesting group of people. Um, Cynthia Rudin is my collaborator at Duke. She is the statistical machine learning brains behind the project. Elaine Angelino was my former PhD student. Um, Nicholas Laris Stone was an undergraduate who did his senior thesis on parallelizing this implementation. Daniel Allaby was a first year grad student. And here are two more high school students who, um, and I want to give a special call out to Adicha, who will be applying to college next year. I encourage you to recruit him. He is single handedly pushing us forward on getting the um, systems paper published. Um, and unfortunately, you can't have a CIOs. He's going to Harvard next year. Okay. So where to put this in the picture, I don't know. So this is actually a discrete optimization problem, and why am I doing it, and why do I call it systems? Because it turns out that making this stuff run fast is a systems problem, and it's a data structures problem, and it's how you build and figure out the right data structures to implement really elegant mathematical frameworks. So if you can build software to make it good, it's a systems problem. Allow me to give you the overview with a short video, which actually summarizes this whole thing, and then I'll talk through it a little bit. If I can figure out how to make the video run, that was not it. Get back here. There's our mouse. There's the video. There's that. And let me see if we can get full screen. Okay, this was working before. No, it's spinning. Okay, maybe we won't do the cute video. Okay. Let's skip the cute video, and you'll have to hear my boring version of it. I encourage you to go watch the YouTube video. It's way better than hearing me talk. For real machine learning problems, is it always true that a complicated black box model will outperform a model that is interpretable? Of course not. In fact, for many real applications, there is a large set of almost equally accurate classifiers including some that are interpretable. The challenge is how to find these accurate yet interpretable classifiers. For many years, greedy methods like classification and regression trees, associative classification methods, and decision list methods have been used to find interpretable logical classifiers. But these methods do not always perform well and often do not actually provide interpretable models. It could be that no accurate yet interpretable model exists for your problem, or it could be that the interpretable model exists but that the greedy algorithm couldn't find it. After all, the space of logical models is exponential in the number of features. But how do you know which it is? Is it that no accurate yet interpretable model exists, or that your algorithm just couldn't find it? Maybe an accurate yet interpretable model actually does exist. Luckily, as it turns out, to construct some kinds of models, and in particular rule lists, the part of the space we need to search isn't as large as it seems. In this paper, we produce an algorithm that actually optimizes over the full space of rule lists. The algorithm is called Certifiably Optimal Rule Lists, or CORLs. Rule lists are a kind of one-sided decision tree. If a very simple rule list model exists that predicts accurately on the training set, this algorithm is guaranteed to find it. Here is an example of a rule list generated by our algorithm. This list predicts whether someone will be arrested within two years of being released from prison. There's nothing unintuitive here. It finds that prisoners with longer criminal histories and younger prisoners are more likely to be arrested after they are released. This model looks like a heuristic for predicting recidivism, but it is a full-blown predictive model that was certified within two minutes to be optimal according to a regularized empirical risk on the training data, which was the ProPublica dataset on recidivism. The algorithm uses a combination of tight bounds to use in a branch and bound algorithm, fast bit vector calculations, and some very useful data structures. We use a prefix try to keep track of all the rule lists we've tried so far. We prove that we can find any optimal rule list, starting with the rule list we have at the try in any time. We have a symmetry aware map to keep track of the optimal permutation for any given set of rules, and a queue of rule lists to look at. Once the queue is empty, we've searched or eliminated the whole space. Corals is a good competitor for decision tree methods like CART. The code for Corals is publicly available. Okay, so that's the overview. And the one line summary I like to do to describe this is we solve NP hard problems to optimality on laptops. And these are real problems from fields like 
criminal recidivism, medical stroke prediction, and stuff like that. So Cynthia is the math genius, and I advise the students on how we can do clever systems things. So here's a decision tree. Decision tree is a binary tree where you split based on some attribute, and then at the leaves, we make predictions about the outcome of the decision problem. A rule list is simply a one-sided decision tree, where instead of continuing to split, we find the most important attribute, we make a prediction based on that, and then we look for the next one. And so it's a slightly simpler problem than a full decision tree. Lest you wonder, we're working on optimal decision tree algorithms as we speak, and we think we have a pretty competitive algorithm there. So the way we do this is we're going to view the family of all possible rule lists as a tree. So let's imagine that we have only four rules here. Then every rule list is some ordering of those four rules. So in this picture, each rule has a different color. And so this is all possible lists that we might construct with four rules. Does that make sense? So each of these nodes might be something like, you know, how many priors a person has or what the age has. And each one of the different colors is a different rule. And right now, this is only working with binary attributes, okay? So the first thing we do is we say, let's look at all rule lists of list one. And for each of those, let's calculate the accuracy of the rule list that has just that one rule. So you go with the majority opinion on either side, and you figure out how many mistakes you make. And we keep track of the error, and we figure out which one has the best error. So right now, if we did nothing else, and we only had a rule list with one rule, we could get 80% accuracy, according to this. Now, the other thing we're going to compute is something called a lower bound which is any rule list that starts with one of these rules, let's imagine that by adding other rule lists below it, they all predicted perfectly. Okay? That's the best possible rule list you could build starting from a given rule. And the value of the accuracy of that is our lower bound. That says that no matter what we do, any rule list will have that lower bound. So we're going to compute the lower bound for all of these. Okay, that's the explanation. And so what we find is that the best lower bound for the blue rule is 0.05, and for here it's 0.01. And when we have only one rule, what that really is is how many mistakes does this particular rule make, right? How many points evaluate true for this rule, but we predict the wrong way. Now, once we have all those points, uh, once we have all those lower bounds, what you realize is that no matter what rule lists we produce, they're going to have an error at least as big as those bounds. All right. That is going to help us bound things because any lower bound that is worse than our best current error is not interesting. Right? So in this case, none of these are worse than the point two. But let's consider lists of length two. So we'll do the same thing. We're going to grow the tree. We're going to recompute all the bounds here. And now we're going to say, oh, look, our smallest error is now only 10%. It is possible, you know, there's a rule list that we can build that gets 90% of the predictions correct. If we then look at all our lower bounds, what we see is that some of them are bigger than our current best, best error. So no matter what I do, if I build trees out from any of those others, they are not going to produce better results than that tree I have right there. Given that no, none of those can produce better results, I can prune them. I never have to look there again. And that's really, that's the biggest key insight in this, is that we can prune the tree and get rid of nodes. And so every bound that we introduce in this algorithm, and there are about 14 of them, are just different things that we can figure out that let us prune the tree. And so you repeat this process for trees of length three, you get to prune more, and when you get to all the lists of length four, then what you've got is you've found a globally optimal tree. And so there are a bunch of different ways that we prune this tree. That lower bound is one of them, but the other one is something that we call symmetry-aware pr permutation, symmetry-aware pruning. So if I have two rules, 
P and Q. Regardless of what order I place them in, they're going to, just, they're going to try to predict exactly the same points. Okay? So one of them will have a better accuracy than the other. Given that everything below them are the same, then whichever one has better accuracy with just P and Q will have better accuracy with all of its longer lists. And so you can throw away the other ordering. So every time we look at a symmetry, A, B, and C versus B, C, A, only one of those ever has to be searched. And so the symmetry aware map is the second key data structure that lets us figure out massive parts of the search space to prune. And if you, know, I can, if, if you want to see the paper, we can show like just how much of the search space this, this symmetry aware map takes care of. Does that make sense? Great. And so the data structures that we use to do this, the queue is fairly boring. It's a regular queue. The prefix try is, you know, addresses the question of how do I keep track of all the rule lists that I've tried without building an exponentially large data structure? And so that's what the try does. And then the symmetry aware map, we take a canonical order of the rules and we say we always look it up by this canonical order. And then in here, we keep track of which one has the best order and what its lower bound is. So if I get the rule list XSZ, XSY, I look it up here and I say, well, I've got something that already has a lower bound of 0.05. Is this new one better? If it is, I put it in the map. If it's not, I just throw it off the tree immediately. And because this is a systems talk, I have to show you data. So um, it took me a while to be able to not scream every time I saw a y-axis that didn't begin at zero. But the machine learning people tell me it's OK. So I try not to twitch too much. So what we have on the y-axis is the accuracy of the models. And what we have on the x-axis is the model size, i.e., how many nodes or how many rules are in the list. And so for interpretability, you want shorter lists. As Cynthia likes to say, if I'm going to have a real user who's not a computer scientist, I need to be able to hand them the model on an index card. So sparse is good. The corals implementations are the purple boxes. And so what you see is that pretty much almost at every vertical slice, which is for every model of a specific size, corals is as accurate or more so than the competing algorithms. And basically, by the time you get to six rules, corals is as accurate as any of the conventional algorithms that have many, many more um, rules in them and therefore tend to go for overfitting. So we're pretty excited, and we're now trying to repeat sort of this approach for full-blown decision trees, as well as a big class of linear models. So only a few minutes over, and I got through all three vignettes. Thank you for your patience. Um, I am looking for postdocs and students, so please contact me if you are in that market. And if they are allowing me, I'm happy to take questions. So we're a little over, but we definitely have time for questions if you still have voice left. Yeah, no, my, my schedule said that I took Q&A for another eight minutes, okay. so, so we're good. Oh, come on, don't be bashful. Any yes. Questions? How can you tell that these rule sets are actually robust? Like, I don't know what optimal actually is. Optimal with respect to the training set? So, so the rule lists are optimal with respect to the regularized loss on the training data. And um, so the results I showed you were actually tenfold cross-validation. So that speaks to generalizability. Um, and now I'm going to sort of parrot what I've learned from, from my machine learning colleagues is that when it comes to interpretability, the generalizability is a function of the accuracy on the training and the sparsity. And since we're able to produce models that are sparse, with accuracy comparable to the competing algorithms, that speaks well for its generalizability. If there are ML people in the room who want to like correct me on that, please feel free. That is totally not my expertise, but that's my understanding is that basically what, what we're showing is that because they're both sparse and accurate, that speaks well for their generalizability. Yes? Uh, 
Um, okay, I should know the answer to this. Hold on a second. So, right, so the vertical bars are the, t oh, so I think, ah, what it is, so we've done a tenfold cross-validation and you can specify some parameters to things like cart, but that doesn't guarantee you a certain number of features. And so when you set the cart parameter, for example, to point um, 03, you know, on average you get where the big blue dot is, but you can get models of varying sparsity. Yes. So you would never deviate from that. Is there, have you ever thought of maybe other ways or is there more futuristic work that tries to deviate but has some formal guarantees that it won't take those things? Great. So the question is, in the ask work, we only accept speculations if they produce exactly the same result as the initial computation. And the question is, could you imagine relaxing that? And the answer is absolutely. So, you know, the easy thing for me to say is, you know, approximate computing, hand wave, hand wave, hand wave. Instead, let me give you an example of when we're doing that. So our physics colleagues that I was talking about, what they're really trying to do is search this energy landscape. And energy landscapes have like wells in them. And so they have taken not this code, but this exact technique of speculation to say, you know what, it doesn't matter if you get exactly the right prediction, if you're in the same energy well, that counts. And so they have actually used exactly that approximate technique to speed up their stuff. Um, and so we've actually had better luck publishing the concepts behind this in the physics literature than in the systems literature because it's exactly that kind of stuff. So you could imagine loosening this up for all sorts of numeric kinds of computation where you know that you have tolerances that are okay. It would probably require knowing something more about the state, and so it's going to require a fight between me and Amos about whether that's allowed or not. Any other questions? Provenance, corals, yes? Great. Great. So the question is, why don't you always start with the most accurate rule? And so the answer is, imagine that we have a rule who, as the first element in the rule list, is 80% accurate, and my rule is only 70% accurate. But it might be that once you split your 80%, 20% off, none of the rules can predict any of those points, you know, or, or, or it's very, very bad. Whereas it turns out that my 70% rule leaves me exactly you know, the women as the other 30%, and therefore I can predict them perfectly. So the problem is, and, and all those other algorithms like CART are in fact greedy algorithms fundamentally, and so you don't know how close you are to optimal when you do that. One of the nice things about the corals is that because we can prove we have the optimal list, then you can actually evaluate other techniques and you can say, well, this one has faster runtime and is usually as good. And so um, the certificate of optimality actually tells you a lot about the other algorithms as well. Does that make sense? Great. Was there another question over here I missed? Yeah. So we have, so the question is, is there a way to make programs with large state more parallelizable? The answer is undoubtedly yes. I can't tell you exactly what it is. I am confident that some of these programs that have large state would benefit from sort of a fast copy on write checkpointing. So I think we can actually speed it up even without asking the programmer to do more work. One of the philosophical cornerstones of this work comes from the frustration that we see from our colleagues in domain sciences who do not 
want to spend their lives rewriting applications. And so part of our mission has been to require as little as possible from the original code. And we, and we get, it's funny, we get into a little bit of a debate with systems and, and scientific computing people, and they're like, well, there are much better algorithms to do some of these problems. And the reality is there are. But many of the domain scientists would rather just write in a really straightforward fashion, simple, understandable code, as opposed to them having to go figure out what's the best algorithm and how do I do that. So in some sense, our philosophy is can we make it really easy to write simple, understandable code and still get the benefit of some of the more complicated algorithms. And so asking people to restructure so that we can run faster feels like we're shirking our responsibility. So you can think of this as if this were, if our goal were to like get our people running really quickly now, we might make different decisions. But as a research project about what's possible and how much can we automate, we're trying to be sort of philosophically, I don't want to say clean, but you know, focused on a very philosophical standpoint about that. So it's not that I think that's a bad approach. It's undoubtedly helpful, but we're trying to stay agnostic and, and encourage people to write really, really simple code in Python like how they want it. <laughs> One more. So the question is, do we explicitly analyze the stack or the heap to figure out space we can ignore? So the answer is we don't explicitly do that. The speculation sort of takes care of it because it says we never touch these. And but in terms of the state space, that's exactly the kind of optimization I think we could do and we don't. Okay. So if people still have questions, I think you can come up after and talk to Margo. So we have a small gift from the school. Oh, thank you. To encourage you to not wait 25 years to come back. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Let's thank Margo. Okay.